Hey, Lem Listeries, I'm super happy to be joined today with Aaron Ross, also known as the king of predictable revenue. For those of you who don't know Aaron Ross, he helped Salesforce grow to 100 million in revenue and wrote two best-selling and amazing books, Predictable Revenue and From Impossible to Inevitable, which are considered today both as sales bible. Aaron, thanks a lot for accepting my invitation. Yeah, yeah I'm excited to be here. <laughs> and on, on Zoom, on Facebook, on whatever. <laughs> so I was actually chatting with you and um, telling you about the community, that the fact we're it's really international community. So I'd love to ask a, a quick question before we start to all the people who are live. Can you tell us in the comment below where you're from? Also, during the live, make sure to ask all your questions directly in the comments uh, as Vuk was working with us will basically select the best questions and send them directly to me so I can ask Aaron about it. Yeah. So to give you a bit more context, the interview will be divided into two parts. The first one will be about prospecting during a crisis. And the second part will be more about the future of predictable revenue. Are you ready, Aaron? <laughs> I'm ready. By the way, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Paris. I think you can, you can maybe like uh, heard the, the French accents. <laughs> Yep. Uh, I am originally from California, Silicon Valley, but nice. now we moved a couple months ago to Edinburgh. Ah, nice. Here in the, in the United Kingdom right now. All right. So we're in the same time zone. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. Maybe yeah. in a one hour difference. Are you getting used to the Scottish accent or? No, but it's no. all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, that's easy. It's the weather. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but it's a beautiful <laughs> city. I mean, it's amazing here. Yeah, it's actually, nice. Favorite city I actually lived in Glasgow for eight months. So it was uh, oh, yeah. okay. pretty close. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> awesome. So we're currently in, um, in a crisis, you know, with uh, COVID-19. So I was super curious because we don't really know the overall impact that it will have on the economy. So for the time being, do you think that it's smarter to go all in on prospecting right now or focus on ex existing clients and strengthening relationship with them or do both and in what terms? Yeah, well, of course, the answer is both. And company by company, people need to follow. There's this playbook, right, which is, and I don't know how many uh, executives are here versus salespeople, but if you're an executive, right, it's, you know, make sure you have more runway, like more time for your company. So usually cutting expenses, it's like you're cutting expenses. You're also looking at churn, how many customers do you have and which ones are in the category, there's some customers that are like hitting a wall. They're just, they're done like restaurants, yeah. travel, um, who's in that. And you probably, you just can't save them. Yeah. Problem. And there's some customers are probably doing even better. Uh, a lot of virtual yeah. stuff and a lot of customers in the middle and kind of re-looking at, okay, for the customers we have, how do we, what can we do for them? So the first thing is, is to focus on the, the expenses you've got, reducing them and the customers you have. Mm -hmm. That may not be relevant to your, you know, if you have a team of prospectors or if you have salespeople, it may or may not be relevant to them. So it might be executives and special teams talking to customers. In the meantime, the third step is too, how are you going to grow? How are you going to create revenue? Which also includes how you, how we're going to adapt what you're doing. Because we're in this situation where everything has changed, everything continues to change. What you were messaging and ideal customers were a month ago may not be what they are today. What your product offerings were a month ago may need to change, especially if you're a services company. Yeah. No one really knows. So we're in this very unpredictable time, right? That's the word of the year, unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no way to know where it's gonna go. So I think if you have, if you need to prospect, realize that First step is if you have, if you're someone in a team where there's quotas, yeah. they pretty much need to throw those quotas away. Like okay. Old expectations for the company, old expectations for quotas need to be usually thrown away. And you also need to kind of look at almost week by week right now, this week, what do we want to accomplish? And at the end of the week, like, what happened? And then reassess for next week. Okay. Um, just because things are changing still so much. And we don't know right now, is this uh, gonna get worse for a while and then will it get better and then even worse after that? And there might be waves of this. So you just have to be practice being adaptable. Okay, Go. and I think there were something like um, super interesting that you said here. So it's essentially like um, 
again, like in your book, you talk a lot about segmenting your customers and we'll come back to that after, but yep. focusing like basically on the one that are, that still have a chance to survive based on the crisis and that are thriving also. And um, from in another book, like um, from um, predictable to inevitable, you're talking about, you know, like finding yes, your niche. This one. Yeah. <laughs> impossible. Uh, yeah, to impossible sorry. For this impossible. is this, yeah, the sequel to predictable revenue. Uh, nice. Yeah. Jason this one, can, yeah. Yeah. You're talking, you know, about like um, essentially like uh, in the seven steps, like to, to the success, you're talking about finding your niche. Do you think like it can actually be a um, great opportunity? Sorry about that. A great opportunity for you like to to actually like find your niche because in the example you mentioned you mentioned like okay you're focusing let's say on four to five industry do you think right now could actually be the time to even be more focused on one industry that you know that is thriving and go the extra mile and start uh, you know your growth engine on on that vertical and on that uh, specific industry yeah for sure so i think that in general like that first step i mentioned is kind of reset all your prior expectations yeah, okay. for what things should be. Right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone's read the book or heard of this book called Who Moved My Cheese? It's okay. probably 20 or 30 years old, but it's all about people um, wanting it to go back the way it was. Okay. And not in resisting what today is like. So again, this might be, in this case, could be a VP of sales who's like, well, your quota last, you know, basically quota, if they've been 10 sales qualified opportunities a month and like, you still have your quota for 10 and you know, it's <laughs> versus yeah. like, it's just not, it will not work. Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work. Right? Yeah. So that's number one. Number two is getting the side of nailing a niche. Mm -hmm. And for that book, it's the whole first section because nailing a niche is the most common. It always has been the most common problem companies and actually people struggle with if they're trying to grow. And the problem is you can't, most people struggle to grow because they're not ready to grow. So yes, now in this time of, of uncertainty and every, everything's kind of going through a restructuring, you need to kind of triple down on this idea of nailing a niche, which really means who is your ideal client today, which may or may not be the same as a month ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. and who needs you the most? What's their problem? Again, the problem that got may or may not be the same as a month ago. And then what are you going to say to them that, will intrigue them in starting a conversation, like your message. So that now might change to be even more, I would say, if to be more and more specific. I'll give you an example. Yeah. There's a woman here in Edinburgh I met in Rebecca who has a growth consulting practice. Okay. And she was like, what do I do? She's looking for advice. Um, I said, well, growth consulting is so general. Like, what's an example of a project you do that clients really appreciate? And she said, board development. I was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> click. I actually, in fact, I actually know someone who's developing a board right now. I'll make an introduction. Yeah. So you can be more and more focused. Mm -hmm. And whether this is a company or as a campaign, but you're really sharpening your signal so that it more easily cuts through the, the noise and the fear and anxiety. So it's easier yeah. for your prospects to see, oh, that's relevant. And yeah, I could use that. Nice. So yes, yeah. you go back and the more specific, and in fact, we're, our company, my company is doing this as well. Like we're yeah. like everyone else. We've got uh, a little like 50, 55 people, about a five or $6 million company. And we build outbound sales teams. And so we, some things aren't changing, but there's, we're kind of looking at our menu of services. Like what should we offer to people uh, before, if we were doing like 30,000, if $30,000 projects, should we look at like a five or $10,000 versions? Like what do we do to kind of fit the new, the new normal or okay. the new situation <laughs> the new unpredictable <laughs> the new unpredictable <laughs> i like that title and um yeah so essentially like um if we if we recap it's like starting with your customers maybe finding a new niche if, or seeing where basically you can see the most opportunity adapting so don't basically have the same sales quotas that you used to have for q2 q3 just adapt with time and be flexible with uh, with potential quotas so moving from there, I was um, super curious because, you know, like uh, when you joined Salesforce, I think it was more or less at the same time of the internet bubble crisis, which I think it was um, right after or yeah, just right, right so, after. Yeah, um, I, I lost a bit. I was the CEO of a business that went out of business in 2001. Yeah. Uh, one, mm -hmm. and I joined Salesforce basically like a year and a half later in late okay. 2002. Yeah. 
And um, Salesforce had dipped and was just starting to grow back when I started. Uh, There's about okay. 150 people there. And did you see like the, the impact of a growing business during a crisis or were there like tips at that time that you think could be applied today or? Um, yeah, it wasn't so there's, and there's a lot of people who write about this, but I think, you know, from my experience, mm -hmm. um, it's, if you have a business, if you're an executive, you do need to look at, um, to have assuming things are going to get worse before they get better. Okay. You generally should probably cut people's salaries by 20% and executives maybe by 30%. Okay. Uh, there's kind of this choice where I know at our company, um, we said, we didn't want to lay people off. So we looked at okay. salary cuts instead of trying to lay people off just to make sure we had more runway. Nice. Cause you yeah, don't know how long this is going to last. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so that's reducing expenses. There's a lot of lenders that are in, in uh, landlords who are offering basically like debt or payment holidays mm -hmm. for one, two or three months. That's pretty common. So like either, get relief from the people you owe money to look at getting some more money kind of increase your runway okay whether it's for you personally or for your company like step okay. one so that's always one increase your runway and then look at how are you going to adapt to again this is going to nail a niche like what your customers who your who your best customers are going to be and what you're going to sell to them do you need to adjust your offerings or do you need to pivot the whole company okay. there's a lot of companies that didn't go out of business there's a lot of people who have already lost jobs and I think it's also important to remember that this is a little bit like a world restructuring in a way. Um, it sucks to lose a company. I've, I've been through that. Having said that, it's also the thing I learned the most from yeah. one of them. And as long as you have, you don't need, your company doesn't have to survive. You don't need a company. Yeah. What you do need are, like you don't need a company, you don't need a job. What you do need are friends, family, or community people who are willing to help you and have you help them like you need food and shelter mm -hmm. so there's a lot of a lot of the stress and uncertainty is really because of people's expectations of what their life should be like and fear of failure mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel good like you yeah. know so and i have a business still i've got a house i've got a family i have a lot at stake um lots of people have lots at stake i think if you can just focus on um kind of taking care of yourself taking care of your team, taking care of the people that you know around you, the community. Like if everyone just continues this wave of helping each other, it's going to be a lot easier for all of us to get through. And so that's been really encouraging. And if you kind of go into this mindset of what's mine is mine, I'm not sharing. Mm -hmm. And like, fuck you. Yeah. Don't take my stuff. Yeah, it would not work. Um, like needy, mm -hmm. it's going to be harder. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, that's, uh, that's some great insights. And actually, like um, I, I found... Um, I found actually recently that you, you had a company prior to, to joining Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And um, yep. I was super interested because in the community we have, we have a lot of salespeople or people working in growth. And we have also a lot of founders as myself. And um, you mentioned that your struggle at that time was you hired a VP sales and then you didn't really know how to do sales at that time. Nope. That's why you decided to join Salesforce. So yep. can you maybe like share your experience as a founder, like, um, what was the one thing that you should advise to founders? Because I think like knowing how to do sales, how to close deals, how to grow the price, how to set yeah. up everything is key. So what were your insights on that? Well, yeah, I think you kind of go back. To basically, my belief is, because um, I learned the hard way, is that founders should sell yeah. and get involved in selling and building a sales team and sales process. Um, you can delegate. So the thing is, I hired a VP of sales. And I abdicated my understanding. I didn't delegate. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, you know, can you deal with it? Okay. So, but CEOs and founders should be involved in selling and selling so that you know, you've got that hands-on feeling, hands-on experience from what works and what doesn't. So that if you then hire someone or need to train someone, you know what you're doing. Yeah. And I think even today, it's a great reminder that executives should go back to selling. Yeah. Again, we're in this space of, we don't know like who our best customers are gonna be, what are they gonna to wanna to buy? The executives should be on the phone, either, either on sales conversations with people or having them or just in, listening in some way, part of that conversation. Because what you don't wanna do is have all your salespeople have those conversations or marketing, whoever you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna abdicate those conversations. You really do mm -hmm. wanna hear yourself, like those customers actually speak yeah. and hear what they're saying. 
and not have that go through a filter. Yeah. And do you feel like, because um, I see actually a lot of founders uh, not doing sales and, you know, going to the um, typical answer saying like, I just have the vision or not actually doing things, you know, um, I need to focus on management. I, but in the end, like, um, do you think they do that out of fear? Do you think it's a fear of like failing or do you think it's, uh, it's more because it's, it's just easier to delegate to someone? Because for me, sales when growing a company is the key to your business. Like if you don't close deal, it's not going to grow. So yeah. by having someone doing that for you, like it's, uh, it's a bit like really delegating it and, you know, like, okay, it's, it's a problem you don't have to focus on. So why do yeah. you think people are doing this? Um, it's mostly because it's uncomfortable. I mean, okay. first, yeah. all those reasons are right, but usually it's because they're not used to it. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there's this kind of myth, this dream. Um, and in fact, I think it's part two. So in the impossible book, part two, it's called, so there's seven parts and there's seven kind of fatal mistakes, uh, yeah. painful truths. And the second one is there's no, like there's no such thing as an overnight success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sure. the way that you, like sales is a life skill. If you want to be successful at anything, you need to be able to sell yourself an idea or a product. And you're not going to be able to build a team that has an effective sales function for the long term unless the founder or some part of that founding team is actually actively selling. Having said that, the dream is if I just create, write a product that's interesting enough, I'll just write a great, create a great product that people love so much they'll come and buy. And it's basically because again, I don't want to sell. It's this weird thing or market, right? I don't want to have to do the work to market and sell my product. Mm, yeah. It's more of a fear or uh, an uncomfortableness because it's something different. And when you realize that sales is in marketing and all this, sort of how do you make money is a life skill that you need to have to be yeah. successful. Mm -hmm. And you embrace the value of knowing it and how it'll make, it'll be better for you. It'll be better for your company and better for your customers. Actually, most, as you start to sell the bigger customers, most customers need help buying. Yeah. So selling yeah. is not some kind of icky thing. It's incredibly empowering when you know how to have sales conversations and you get to talk to people and help them solve their problems. And again, I think there's just a lot of salespeople, especially as you start to get to selling to bigger companies, a lot of their job is helping customers make better decisions. Yeah. When you're selling the right, when you're, when you're selling from a point of, I want to help you make a good decision for your company, which also benefits my company. Mm. which even better is when you help the customer make a decision that's good for them, whether or not it's good for you. But when sales is done right, the company, basically the salesperson wins or the company wins and the client wins because they get, they make a solution for themselves. Yeah. No, I'm hundred percent aligned with you. Actually, like a couple of weeks good. back, I had, right uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had like a, a chat with uh, Mark Hunter. Not sure if you, if you know him. Uh, uh, yeah. He's yeah. a sales yeah, sales hunter. Expert. Yeah, <laughs> sales something. Yeah, and he was saying like, um, if you stop selling, it means you. I mean, he was saying like, selling is about helping, and if you stop selling, essentially, it means that you you stop helping people, and that's not what you should do in a time of crisis. True. So I think. I mean, Elon true. Musk is one of the greatest salespeople ever. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Mm. To Mother Teresa, yeah. John F. Kennedy, <laughs> Gandhi, yeah, Winston Churchill. <laughs> I mean, forms of persuasion and inspiration. Mm. So yeah, there's lots of ways you can take the idea of selling and, and turn it into like lying and cheating and so on. And people do that, but yeah. it's unlikely that that's that people here are in that boat. And I think, again, mm -hmm. if you just are honest about it, then, yeah. and re, again, realize like you, sales is, it's like a life skill. You have, if you want a company to be successful, again, I learned because I, I, by not knowing sales, one of, it was one of the reasons my company failed. Mm -hmm. hence going to Salesforce to learn sales. Yeah. Um, you just, you have to know how to make money for your company. No, that's very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we just have like um, a question uh, from the, from the audience, actually guys, like make sure to ask all your question in the comments, if you have any. Um, yeah. So it comes from, um, from Nadia. So she's saying, this is the beginning of the end of copycat success. That's apparently something you, you stated on, uh, on yeah. the other day on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, good. Talk about finding your own voice and reaching out with unique messaging. Any tips on how to do that, how to stand out, where to find inspiration and creativity? 
Okay, sure. Now, the thing that you may not like is I'll give you some, um, okay, so I'll just, so here, let me tell you about what worked for me. And I'm still doing, I'm continuing to do this, by the way, it's just different versions. So copycat, let's talk about copycat success first. Um, the world is every year we're more connected, information mm -hmm. travels more quickly. And we're at the point when um, a technique works like a certain email technique or phone technique and very quickly everyone else copies it so then the technique doesn't work anymore yeah right and that's we're not there yet and it may be some number of years but that's kind of the trend um so that what that means is when you're just copying someone's technique right and you're starting to when everyone is zigging and you're zigging it works but then it stops working because everyone's zigged so you need to learn how to zag and the one thing that no one can copy from you is your, you know, whether you're a company or a person or really both is your voice and your style and your brand, right? Predictable revenue, the brand and my own personal brand, no one can copy. Everyone is copying my content constantly, honestly. Like you see how, if you look around, like everyone talking about predictable revenue, this scalable stuff, like that wasn't around 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. All right, whatever people can't copy me and they can't copy you. So what I did at different times, I remember 10 years ago or 12 years ago, um, probably was like taking some time to reflect. And I, one of the things was I just was kind of feeling like I wanted to do some more drawing. Um, I'll just, it's like these, we have these little whispers that we tend to ignore because these whispers are impractical and unrealistic and they're not something we are like, for example, I was just thinking about like, I don't know, like drawing. I felt like kind of drawing and I was talking to a friend, like, why don't you just start drawing? And well, I could look up for a class and you know, she's like, why don't you just know, just you know, in the class, just start drawing. Yeah. And I just started kind of drawing and sketching and this is not a good example, but in my books, sorry, I know I wrote, but like, you know, even this, the cover, like all the art and predictable revenue in this book are stuff I've done. Nice. And, you know, simple stuff. And I like, I've been drawing more um, again, it's just a way I kind of was listening to myself okay. and rather thinking, oh, I'm an engineer, I'm not an artist and ignoring that, which we do. Um, another one is I, So now I've done business books and I've just, especially lately feeling like I want to write fiction, you know, but I'm busy. I don't know fiction. I don't know how to do fiction. I, I mean, when I've tried it, uh, yeah, when I was in high school, I did some, but how, what, like I'd suck at it. How you don't know how to do a novel, like all these things telling myself there's the whisper Nah. So we do that all the time. So I think yeah. that's one thing is to kind of like listen to what is what is in you that wants to get out. It might be doing videos. It might be a certain message. It might be, and by the way, maybe irrelevant to work, right? You might say, hey, drawing and art, that's not related to cold email. And it's not unless you make it that way, like I did with the books. Yeah. And uh, I know, I think actually, even after I published Predictable Revenue and all this, the art I was publishing, I saw a whole trend of like handwritten art online, which I, then it come, everything comes and goes. So I think listening to yourself, those little whispers is really important. And then um, finding ways to kind of like practice them. Yeah. And I know this is a challenge for me with lots, I have six kids here. There's three other kids. We have nine kids total. And it's really easy to have reasons to not develop that voice this new voice right i have my own i have a voice now there's always like another thing to layer on like say mm -hmm. the fiction writing yeah. or other kinds of art i'm interested in um so getting up sometime maybe extra early to have some 20 minutes to myself to practice it or um not being too judgmental around what i do it takes a lot of practice i, I think i blogged for like a year or two before i felt you know it's called like i found my my business voice with predictable revenue so it can take a while for you to, to find your voice. You can't say how long it'll take. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it's kind of an ongoing thing for years. But what you can say is if you don't start, you're not going to find it at all. Which means if you say, yeah. hey, I wrote this email. I put a smiley face. That's horrible. I delete it. <laughs> I would just go back to copy paste. Like you never make any progress. It takes lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of baby steps for most people to get there. Um, it's, so it's actually, I don't know. Yeah. It may, I don't know if that help, feels helpful, but that's that's honest. Like lots of baby steps and just listening to these kind of like these little whispers that are so easy to tune out. Mm. Yeah, but I, to be honest, I I mean I think it's uh, you're making like a lot of relevant points because 
I think we're also, I mean, I know in the, in the US, I think you have a bit less that's, uh, that feeling that we have in France or in Europe, which is more, um, you know, like we're afraid to be judged. Like, I think in the US, people are much more outgoing in a general manner, but in France, we- They're just as judgy in different ways. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that was my feeling, but okay. And um, essentially, like, for example, I remember prior to, to working in SaaS, I, um, I worked for like a very like well-known French luxury company. And in my emails, I, at some point, you know, I was using emojis just because, you know, I always smile. Uh, and I thought that emails, you know, were boring without emojis. And I remember having like uh, this person, like really like, um, I don't know, like working as VP of marketing or something like telling me like, you know, like you're in a luxury company using emoji doesn't look professional, etc. Right, exactly. And I felt like super bad about it. And then I was like, well, I, I just don't care, you know, like I'm going to keep using these emojis. And then at some point, another VP told me like, yeah, I mean, we know you, you know, you're smiling. We know it's you. So if it was another person, that would be weird. But because it's you, you know, like, yeah, keep using these emojis. The emails are cool, etc. And I yeah. think it's, uh, it's just also about just to add on what you said. It's just about like not giving a fuck, you know, about like what other people think. If you want to try it yep. yourself. Yeah, it's hard. It takes practice. It takes it, some encouragement helps. So my wife encourages yeah, definitely. me mm. again. And partly is like the more successful I am with kind of business writing, the harder it can be in other areas because I feel like the pressure goes up. Yeah, definitely. So again, it's not like, but you know, everyone, no one knows, no one has, no one has the answer, right? Everyone's just figuring out day after day, right? No one knows yeah. what the fuck is happening. Mm -hmm. The doesn't know. I don't know where, you know, the experience helps. Yeah, definitely. But honestly, no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So you're not, everyone's in the same boat that way. And this isn't just true today. That's mm -hmm. always true and always will be true. So it takes, again, to kind of this practice. And then I think because I've been through this and kind of found my voice that way before, it's like, I at least know it. It makes it a little easier that way, but it's still hard to get down and like build a new kind of mental habits to do it. Like, mm -hmm. and especially with all the, the drama going on. Yeah. But just, and, but in my books, you know, here's one more example. Okay. Like there's, there's just these little simple drawings. And what I've heard from so many people is it just adds, they're not too, they're just going to add a little bit of life to it, make it a little more fun. Um, they're not like complicated. Yeah, that's you so also. You yeah, know, emojis. It doesn't have to be yeah. like this big complicated thing. Mm -hmm. It could be simple stuff to start with. Yeah. And maybe on video, it might even be like a different background. Like instead of having books, you might have like one of your paintings, you might have toys or yeah. for me, I'll turn it around. Like <laughs> I have moving boxes right now because <laughs> our, our, our ship yeah our shipping container just came a few days ago so <laughs> there might actually be like small things along the way that you resonate with that you end up incorporating and again don't get caught in this trap of business is business and personal is personal i love woodworking and i you know i haven't tried to incorporate it but i could see woodworking or art like whatever or magic tricks which doesn't really mean but um woodworking sure i'm sure there's ways i could come up with uh like maybe you in, incorporating that into my voice at work whether it's having wooden stuff i've built around me or doing a, a, a podcast from a woodwork from like our shed or the building techniques of mixing materials that kind of translate to i don't know you never know but the thing is i gotta start is what do you want to do what's been like kind of bubbling in your mind and your heart that you've been ignoring for the last few months or last few days or last few weeks and how can you like take even one little step today about it nice. that's that's the way to start your voice at some point you have to practice expressing it to others no, I like first that. you can start with yourself and then you gotta it's easier than ever to express it to others on social media today mm -hmm. but it's also harder because everyone else is doing stuff so it's hard to stand out but um let's do it for yourself first yeah, you have no, to. You don't have yeah. to tell anyone. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's uh, that's really really cool. Uh, there is there is a question from uh, Tynan with um, actually like um, bumping a bit on what you said previously. You know, when you were talking about um, reducing cost in your company, he's saying that his um, execs are not executives are not salespeople, and they spend the majority of their time raising money or building the product. Um, how would you encourage them to take part in sales? Do you take over the LinkedIn and email and start sending message campaign on their behalf or how exactly would you do that? You know, so there, um, I would, yeah. I would get them to attend hop on sales calls. Okay. You know, 
if their sales calls, just have them first join with them. So you just listen to, even as an observer and be able to kind of ask questions. I mean, that's an easy place to start. Nice. So you know, like typically, if um, if you invite like your exec like in a in a sales call, uh, would you have him intervene in the sales call? Like, because the customer is going to sure. see that there's someone else. Like, would should they show their face or should it just be like yeah. listener or yeah, yeah, okay. if they want to. Okay. I mean, honestly, the exec could be like, I'm just here to hang out, or they can jump in and mm -hmm. do whatever they want. You know, we're just we're just having a conversation here. We're just friends. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. Very casual. <laughs> um, now I think like, uh, cause we're a bit half time. So um, we're going to go to part two, which essentially is also interesting, the future of predictable revenue. So since the, the book, since you wrote the book, sorry, like a lot has changed. Um, so how do you exactly see how bond in 2020 compared to what you created at Salesforce? Cause I think like, even though like you were mentioning like two main channels with cold calling 2.0, with warming up with email, then starting cold call, but now tons of other channels are available. How do you think like the, the evolution of, of outbound? Yeah, well, lots of stuff has changed and lots of stuff is still the same. Okay. But I think the, one of the biggest, there's two big changes. One is there's a lot more technology today around outbound and mm -hmm. also a lot inspired by the book. Um, the, so the complexity there's more complexity with even just doing outbound. Mm -hmm. It kind of, there's this, it gets complicated. Someone comes up with a simple way. So anyway, there's just more technology. There's more tools. There's more, this is the second thing, more overwhelm, more content, more options. So this is true for people, the salespeople and the customers. And this is a, this is a, a worldwide trend, which is really about more content, more apps, more channels, more messages, more everything. So everyone just kind of gets overloaded more easily. There's just too much information, too many op too, uh, information and choice paralysis. So um, the, the book, Predictable Revenue, if I had to describe it in one word, it was really about focus. And for the, in, in, this, the impossible to inevitable, in, impossible to <laughs> inevitable book came out, uh, it was just updated last year. And I would say that focus it's not, I can't, I don't think I say it with one word in terms of this book, but focus is still a tremendous, tremendous, probably number one part of it. The thing about this different than the impossible book is there's a section I'm very proud of about the journey, right? The ups and downs of entrepreneurship, depression, yeah. um, compare and despair, how things take years longer than you want. Um, so that's not about focus. That's really about I'm not even sure how would I would describe it. Is it persistence? I don't think so. It's just being able to kind yeah, of ride grit. the roller coaster. Yeah. yeah. Grit. You know, this is just knowing, hey, there's ups and downs. It's not going to be, you know, there's just that's part of it. And be able, yeah. yeah, kind of like uh, embracing the shit, like right, you know, having fun when it's fun, but when things go south like they are now, just like dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and some other things, but maybe trust, like trust that you'll get through it, trust with your team. So maybe it's two words to be focused and trust. But what has not changed, for example, is most companies still don't specialize their salespeople. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot to do now. And by yeah. that, what I mean is prospectors who prospect, instead of salespeople doing everything, right? Prospecting and closing, managing customers. You have inbound lead responders who respond to marketing leads, prospectors who do prospecting, new business closers and customer success or account managers. Yeah. Uh, or some version of that, right? And that's all about people doing fewer things better so they can focus on doing one job really well. Okay. Focus. Yeah. That still is too rare. Most companies, especially in Europe, in UK, mm -hmm. around the world, do not do that. Even in the States, a lot don't do that. Okay. That's step one. So I would say if you can do anything, start by looking at your straight sales team and people touching customers and how to like model them after a champion sports team. There's no sports team in the world that says, or like, let's take soccer or football, whatever yeah. you want to call it. So we probably, <laughs> uh, you know, okay, everyone attack and everyone defend. Yeah. No, you specialize. <laughs> so you've got attackers, yeah. defenders, midfield, goalie, and even in management of sports teams, they specialize. They've got uh, coaches, like an attack coach, a defense coach, a coach, a fitness coach, uh, this, that, you know, it's like coaches for every little specialty. Yeah. All right. So even management, to some extent, should move away from this idea that VP of sales can do everything and realize 
they're more should be more of like a coach or quarterback bringing in when you when you need your call coach when you need your email coach when you need your time management coach whether that's an internal person external person um because there's just too much stuff out there so people need to focus on doing fewer things better and that's not that's still going to be that's not going to change it's just going to involve more companies to do that that's step one mm -hmm. just and sorry to interrupt but just on that step because i think it's uh it's really important, like, um, so having people specialized in one specific field, which is, uh, for example, like data researching, then it can be like closing, that it can be basically taking care of customers. But my question to you is, whenever you're onboarding like new people on specific uh, roles, would you have them go through all these steps so they have a better overview of the, the full funnel? Or would you just have them, like if you're hiring, like for example, a SDR or data researcher, Okay, your job is going to be data, so you're onboarded on data and you only do data. Um, I am completely in the camp that employees should be exposed to as many other positions okay, as possible. Yeah. Okay. So even as an SDR, outbound, you know, there's outbound SDRs and inbound SDRs. Yeah. And I just mm -hmm. want to bring up this point because someone did a study that, you know, 75% of companies with SDR teams, and when I use the term SDR, I mean, which is, I don't want to assume what people, you know, these are the junior salespeople responding to inbound leads or doing outbound prospecting. And most companies that have these, this team, they still have SDRs that do, that mix, they respond to inbound leads and they do outbound prospecting, right? And that is a no, no, no. Yeah. That just, that's no. You need, the outbound is to work, you need dedicated outbound, people dedicated to outbound prospecting, period. The only exceptions are if you sell to like consumers or super uh, fast sales cycles, you know, one call, two call, three call, close type, very highly transactional. Yeah. So I, but in onboarding outbound SDRs or anyone, um, and I went through this at Salesforce and I, and that's why I know it works. Yeah. Um, I went out and, and met people in marketing, product, support, success, inside sales, field sales, management. Like I really just made, I just, met everybody to get a sense of how the whole company worked and that was so helpful to me to orient and to know and actually to have contacts in different parts of the company if i never needed anything and so what i would say is even an outbound prospector like part of their onboarding get them to talk to all the other parts of the company so they know what it's like yeah. and they should do the jobs so going back to your other question which is um should they if you have if you have data researchers if you have, if you buy lists, whatever, I still think part of the training should, for an outbound SDR should be at least knowing how to build or update a list on their own by hand. Yeah, definitely. And I'll tell you why. Because first, yeah, how often do they get a list? They don't, because otherwise they don't know how often the list is wrong Yeah. or missing key people or old. And by the way, you can't just assume the list you get is perfect. You got to check the website. Mm -hmm. And then versus having someone else fix it, they should just be able to fix it. At least they, at least they know how it all works, whether they do it or not. So you need that whole kind of that picture of how it all works. Um, it's just like a, a founder. At some point you should hire a VP of sales, but at least if you do the sales yourself, you know how it works and then bring in the right person. So a prospector should know how it all works, even when they're working with data researchers or other, um, how to, def I mean, ideally they should know how to define their own dashboards, even if they've got a sales ops person. Yeah. Right. So that's where I come from, my background. Nice. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think like if people have the bigger picture, it makes it makes much more sense because for me, I don't think like uh, I don't usually recommend buying lists because they're usually like outdated, or, except if you have like people doing that for you, like uh, that are building lists manually and then selling them to you like fresh. But um, otherwise, like people are changing job too often. I, I think LinkedIn is still like a, a good source of really like fresh data and lots of people can go there, but it's more on the personalization side of it, where I feel like if the person doing the data research doesn't understand the next step when you're doing like your prospecting of reaching out to people and the key information that you need to get more replies, I think that sometimes, you know, they just don't do the job correctly and it's good to have like a, a bigger picture. Um, yep. So, Okay, so there, there were one point that uh, that's kind of interesting for me is like um, regarding like the multi channels. So we we didn't really touch a lot on it. So more multi, more like channels of uh, 
of acquisition that are possible, especially in B2B now. So it used to be like, um, what, what do you like usually advise? Like, do you think it's, it's better to master only one channel? Do you think it's still good like to try multi-channel? Like how don't you get lost, you know, in all the channels? Like how, how what would you advise now? Yeah, well, there's the big three for most companies, right? This mm -hmm. is LinkedIn, email, and the phone. Okay, yeah. And the balance of those will change market to market based on kind of your, who your customers are. And yeah, of course now everyone, you know, everything's been changing. So even three, three weeks ago, people weren't picking up the phone as much, right? So the phone people, phone results were up and then they went down and then people started, then they went back up when people start working from home. Yeah. So this is kind of finding the right mix. And there are a lot of other channels, right? There's, there's WhatsApp and I would call text messages is a different channel and yeah. Instagram. And some of these specialty channels could work for you if, depending on who your market is. Like if mm -hmm. a lot of your customers are on Instagram, that could yeah. work. Yeah. A lot of B2B people still aren't, still not yet, maybe the next generation. And a uh, text message and WhatsApp, I think my belief is they tend to be I better at kind of uh, follow up. Like once you make connection on a okay. core channel like LinkedIn or email, yeah. phone, then you might look at um, WhatsApp or text mm -hmm. messages or similar like messaging apps. Okay. After Do you that. think it's too intrusive otherwise? Like uh, if you receive that as like cold WhatsApp, I would I would feel intrusive, but yeah, I think it's hard to do that well. Yeah, someone's probably done it, but it is hard to do it well with something that works. So, so I'm, you know, if you see a good example of it, let me know. But okay. for most people, they're <laughs> we'll just not you. gonna they're gonna fumble it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, I I yeah. tend to agree on that. Um, so at some point in your book, you know, like you you were really mentioning how you know like um, lead qualification, how important it is. But can you explain mm -hmm. like um, quickly? how you would um how you should focus on which account and why like how do you how do you know which account you need to spend time on and also like what would be the easiest way to know where you need to spend your time on sure well the number one if i step back i'm developing kind of like a new uh workshop and and maybe ebook around outbound sales mistakes that even smart leaders make and i was thinking about kind of there's these three categories of things right there's really targeting which yeah. is which accounts to go after and this is a whole nail and niche topic mm -hmm. and then there's technique which is how you write emails or messaging calls and then team design so like comp and everything else and if i go back to like technique organization really is the key to success for a lot of this for in in high volume sales whether it's inside sales or prospecting organization really is so essential and a lot of that really comes down to probably this, the biggest waste of time and outbound is targeting companies and people who are not relevant, and not going to buy at all. Yeah. And you may or may not be shocked that anyone who's senior in your company, if you went into your team and looked at the list of who they're targeting, you'd probably be surprised at what a high percentage of poor fit clients, poor fit targets they're targeting. Okay. I don't have a percentage for you, but you probably look through this and be like, why are you even talking to all these companies? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, it's completely irrelevant. It happens to me in my own company. And it's easy to forget that for people who are newer to outbound to your company, it takes some time to develop this sense of who's a good fit and who's not. Okay. And what you can do as a company is this, uh, going back to that nail and niche approach of defining your ideal customer, who needs you, how are they different from when you're nice to have, trying to make it as clear as possible for people on your team, whether it's in sales or marketing, to spot them when they're a good fit and to spot them when they're a bad fit. So it's, it is documentation, but documentation plus a lot of practice mm -hmm. for that, you know, listening to people's conversations. I mean, the best way to ramp someone is have them on the phone, hearing either talking to or hearing people talk to customers as much as possible. Mm -hmm. That is the fastest way to ramp someone. Yeah. So learning. would you, would you, for example, in a, in a very practical way, cause I know like um, we can record calls essentially, like whenever you're doing like sales prospecting, I mean, a lot of calls are recorded. Would you, for example, try to spot, let's say five or 10 calls that were super successful and where they got tons of information and put that into your onboarding for when you have like a, a new salespeople coming in? Um, yeah, that's a great way to do it. I mean, live calls as well, mix them in, but yeah, mm -hmm. recordings, if they, if they were good ones, 
Um, you know, it's like things change, those can work, but again, like stuff changes, you might, you can also uh, just make sure that they are getting on live calls as part of the onboarding. Okay. Like assigning yeah, them nice. to, you know, whether it's with support, sales, marketing, it's mm. you know small business sales enterprise like just hearing hearing variety like uh also a great way to ramp outbound prospectors is calling inbound leads or old inbound leads okay because that's yeah, the, it's a much faster way to have more conversations mm -hmm. there were something interesting in what you say about the importance of building personas i think like there are a lot of companies who don't really have like personas like that are clearly stated etc Uh, with you know like all the characteristics uh, very like well described and what I figured out also in in companies you know is that essentially they they, they might have personas but whenever you're doing like um, whenever you're doing like uh, the prospecting let's say uh, you're targeting for example um, I don't know companies who are um, growing or who are like uh, growing by 10x every year or like 5x every year So that's going to be something you're going to put in your persona. However, uh, I feel like when you're doing the research, lots of salespeople get lost and don't know how to search for it. So we kind of developed something around like um, scrapable personas where we added, um, you know, like key indicators of what you should, you should search on LinkedIn for. Do you think like that's something that should be done in companies or like what's your like uh, idea around that? Or have you seen this problem already happened? Yeah, well, the trick is, um, ideally, how many of the criteria for ideal customers can you include that you can actually, there's kind of like public data and private data. Yeah. And then you can say, hey, they need to have a, a marketing budget of at least 20,000, you know, online marketing budget of $20,000 yeah, a month. That, yeah. But, you know, you can't find that out usually unless you actually talk to someone, right? So it's like yeah. private information. So the more that you can flag those criteria as things that you could search for online in some way the better but you can't get all of it so because like trying to find companies who are growing 5x a year sometimes you can get lists of that but it's that'd be a hard one yeah to get reliably mm -hmm. um so there's lots of you're just trying to how do you best distinguish the companies who need you the most and are great buyers from yeah. when they don't really need you it's a nice to have How can you look at all those criteria as much as possible, put it on paper, but then realize a lot of the learning doesn't come. It's more of a reference sheet. A lot, most of the learning comes from people listening to conversations and having them okay. with those customers, both ones who are a good fit and the ones who are not a good fit. You know, new prospectors can learn a lot from talking with customers, who, customers who are not a good fit as well. You get that pattern recognition. Yeah, that's true. No, that's true. Um, I have a question also, because we were talking about the, the evolution, you know, of, of salespeople and, um, you know, like usually uh, in sales, we often categorize, you know, the salespeople into two categories, like the farmers and the hunters. Um, how do you think salespeople have evolved today? Like, do you feel like there are new categories coming in or do you still see like those two big categories with farmers and, and hunters? Um, yeah, the thing is, you know, there's, there theoretically would be, you know, if there's, 100,000 salespeople, and if you took a group of 100,000, there's probably 100,000 categories, right? Yeah. So we're just kind of using very basic proxies. And for me, um, I'm actually kind of spacing, I call them, uh, I, I think of like builders and growers is a different way to think about it. Okay. Like people who like to build things versus people who like to take something that's already built and grow it. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're more, if you're starting a business, you're starting a sales team, you need builders versus once it's working, you could use more growers. Okay. So there's lots of ways you can look at people. Um, hunters and farmers is a great place to start. And I still think that applies, but you know, there's more types of roles and there's more types of people. It's kind of, we're getting, you know, everything's going towards the spectrum, right? Gender spectrum, autistic spectrum. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other jokes around different kinds of spectrums. Yeah. And so, you know, start with hunters and farmers. It's not a bad one. And then realize you're going to probably have some other classifications. Uh, I don't, I've never found a real personality test that's super useful. Some people do. Mm -hmm. um, I like builders and growers more for okay. hiring. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. I think like um, I've been like seeing a lot more in, um, on LinkedIn, for example, what the, the type of salespeople that I would call like the, the storytellers So, you know, like the one that are, because in the past, I felt like a lot of salespeople, you know, were more focused on, 
you know, one task, as you said, like either closing, either, you know, like searching or, you know, like they were like those closers, uh, the hunters, etc. But right now I feel like more and more salespeople tend to have um, a more marketing mindset where they're going to try to bring value and, you know, post more. So build also their personal brands. And I feel like for me, it's, uh, it's driving also. And I think it's interesting to see that at some companies where they're really like driving a lot of leads from personal brand within the company. I think it's circled back to what you were saying, you know, um, with uh, basically like at the beginning, find your own voice, et cetera. Do you think like personal brands within companies can really have a huge impact on, uh, on sales in general or? Um, you know, I was kind of thinking about this even for, with our own company is like yeah, exactly. how, and this is not even urgently, like how can we, encourage our people to develop themselves in whatever way they want to, whether it's inside work or outside of work. I mean, we have a lot of musicians at our company. Um, at least we have a lot of people, we have about a couple dozen people in Vancouver, Canada, and a couple dozen in Mexico, and I'm in the only one in the United Kingdom. Um, but like if people are succeeding at creating music and producing music outside work, like a lot of those skills will translate to whatever they're doing at work. So, are there ways to do it that actually make a difference? I'm not sure. I think in a minimum, it, I think it helps people enjoy their work more and trust the company more and be more present. Yeah. For the most part, you can see people, some people getting distracted, but I think, you know, you got your day job. Um, when the company encourages people and supports them, they're going to be more likely to support the company back. Whether that generates actual leads, I don't know. Probably mm -hmm. not, maybe. <laughs> I think, I think for some people, like I see like um, good, ex I mean, I see a few examples of VP sales that are really posting good and relevant comp content, you know, like kind of from the trenches. And I feel like it's, it's helpful for their brand, but uh, it's difficult also to measure like the, the data because, you know, people go look at your profile, then come to your website, then, you know, get, yeah. it's also part of the branding. So it's kind of yeah. top of funnel. Um, I know executives. Yeah. So there's, in other words, there's going to be a, f a small number of people at a company where if, if you have a hundred people and everyone's posting on whatever channels, some, there will be a few people. I don't know if it's three or seven or two, but there's be some small percentage that will get enough traction that it'll be, yeah. you know, helpful, but not most people. Mm -hmm. And that's all right. Yeah. Um, there is, there is, because uh, we we're gonna run out of time. So, a few questions from the from the audience. <laughs> sure. So, question from what Hansen. is the average land speed of an African swallow? <laughs> I don't know. I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Anthony. So, this crisis is the right time for most companies to integrate digital digitalization. They currently have to do it because of the emergency, but these new models must be continued over time. How to make them understand that is not a passing fad? Well, the thing is, if you're just, a lot of companies are still in crisis mode, mm -hmm. they're figuring out their spend, they're figuring out their, do they need salary cuts? Do they need to shift markets, pivot? They're not, no one's going to be buying yet. They still need to kind of get that figured out before they're being ready to say, oh, we need an initiative. Do we have money? Are we going to spend? Yeah. So a lot of people just, you know, I know it's frustrating. You like, I have something that they need help with and I know I can help them and they need it, but they just may not be ready yet. You know, they just may not be ready. So you would just so try to maybe education, like, yeah, education. Yeah. Ultimately, like one thing you can't go wrong with is education. In fact, you know, our, our mission, our predictable revenue.com's, company mission is to educate the world on how to grow a company because it's such so a part of what we do right it was the books and teaching and so education something in relationships right reaching out to them and whether they buy or not like how can you help them they may not be in a place to buy you know, there's a I just did a webinar too there's a guy who sells to luxury hotels or it might have been a woman a person i don't remember and they're like you know should we should we prospect to them now or not I'm like yeah you should reach out to them they're not going to buy anything right now, but you should like start talking to them and learn. Yeah. Can even be, Hey, I just want to see how are things going? Like, what are you seeing out there? We're talking to lots of other hotels and I can happy to share what we're seeing with, with other people, like more of an, uh, like a knowledge exchange. Yeah. Right. You, you know, they're not going to buy anything right now. So you might as well see what, how else can you help them for now? If someone else had a great quote, which is, you see you're depositing pennies into the bank, 
now to hopefully uh, exchange them for them into dollars later. No, I like that. Plus, it just feels good to help people. But yeah, I know people, you know, yeah. people need to make money or feel like they do. Yeah. There's yeah. businesses and jobs and. No, but it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's good because it's also part of, you know, like building a relationship. You have to also see the, the big picture. It can take time, but you know, like the more you're helping people and if you provide value, buying something from you, it's, it's just, it's, it will make sense at some point, you know? So yeah, I think it's, it's, we it's don't know when. Of, yeah, exactly. You, you never know when it's, um, it's actually funny. Like I had uh, one guy the other day, like messaging me and we had a chat at the very beginning of when we, when we were launching Lemlist, you know, so it was like about two years ago or something. And he messaged me and said like, I've been reading all your content for the last two years. And I finally decided to get like a paid account and start, you know, like using the service. And I was like, okay, like that's, that's really cool. I think that's lesson about sales. You know, it's, it will take time. It takes time. But if you provide enough value, like people, will just, you know, like eventually like buy from you. Um, one last question from Frank, because I think it can be also interesting because we talk a lot about sales, but I think like in the past, uh, what was driving a lot, the revenue were, was sales, but now we see a new trend with rev ops and also like growth. How do you see that trend going basically? Well, yeah, rev ops and like maybe, I don't know if you call them growth operations or sales operations. Yeah. It's, um, there's a guy named Paul Fifield, who I know here in the UK, and he described it, I liked it, which was, if sales specialization, right, the predictable revenue model, we've got like prospectors who prospect and inbound lead responders and salespeople who close new business and customer success are kind of the top. Underneath all that would be some sort of, whatever you call it, it's basically all the support, revenue, yeah. rev ops, sales ops, growth ops, and, you know. Um, everything kind of like enables that, which could be the tools and technologies, could be training, could be defining the metrics, could be management even. Uh, so RevOps is, and sales ops, something that's been underinvested in for a long time. It's been good to see it grow because again, so many people don't get the most out of their tools, whether it's like a salesforce.com or CRM yeah. or Lemlist or, you know, there's a lot of technology and there's more technology than our team's are able to use right, there's a i can't remember the term like app overload right with salespeople having too many apps to juggle they're all it, each one is great but when you add them all together it's too much mm -hmm. no that's uh, that's interesting maybe like um, one last question because it's something we didn't mention and uh, i think it can be it can be cool also to to conclude with it um, in the time of crisis, do you think that pricing become a much more important drivers to sales because you mentioned, you know, early on with your team also, I think that's, uh, you know, you were saying like, okay, we have this $30,000 package. Should we go and see the five to five to 10 K package? Yeah. Like, do you, do you feel like price can be like um, a driving factor to sales during crisis? Or do you still think that price equal value and in, in the end? Well, it's... Yeah, you definitely have to look at it because if people, if everyone's cutting budgets, everyone's more nervous. Yeah. Big, big numbers are going to scare lots of people. Mm -hmm. And it may not be taking the same program or product and just discounting the price. You might just create like a smaller, more affordable version or it's something easier to start with. So I know for us, let's say that we have like one of the things I, I do personally for companies is if they have an outbound prospecting team. And in the past, I would go and do a, an assessment, right? It might be $30,000 to go in and kind of tell you everything that's working, not working, what to do about it. Okay. And so maybe, and then we had created a, we have, a, we already had a remote version for like 20,000. And I'm like, well, maybe we should create like a 10,000 version. That's like, you know, a smaller, not the entire thing, but like a half, you know, like a smaller bite or maybe just like a nail a niche okay. workshop to kind of like point people in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So it's not just reducing the price. It's looking at what do they need? Okay. It still means they're not going to buy it if they don't need it. And what's mm -hmm. the appropriate price? What's the right price for them? Nice to make it easier for them to say yes and for them to get value from it. And I know honestly, there might be, so just one factor. I know we get in this, so they're like, I can't discount the price. It's like maybe an ego thing, but you're just trying to like, how can I best create something that these people are gonna need? And what is that? Again, start with a blank sheet of paper almost if you need to, that helps. Yeah, I know, I really I really like it. I think it's, I think it's interesting like, uh, 
So it's like you lower the value, the overall value that you were giving uh, with your, you're not talking about discounts, which I think is, is the important part here. It's like you can find other packages where you have like a, a lower price, but for a lower value, which if they picture the value and if they see the value will be easier for you later to basically upsell them to something with a bigger value. I, I think it's a yeah, super smart approach. Love it. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Aaron, right, so for, that, for joining us. Yeah. You know. yeah. It was, uh, it was really cool. What's the best way for people to follow you, read your updates, maybe read your last uh, science fiction book? Uh, yeah. Um, well, you'd need, I think you can follow LinkedIn is where I tend to post. Okay. It's, uh, I'm pretty, it should be easy to find LinkedIn. Yeah. But in general, <laughs> like our business and a lot of everything else is predictablerevenue.com. Nice. Easy and to remember. You could probably find a book. I mean, if you really like this, the impossible book is the one that's going to save a lot of, has saved, will save a lot of people's lives. Yeah, definitely. They're great. Um, they're great. Should be on there. And again, there's that nail and niche chapter, which alone is something people just need to be so like in the weeds with right now. Yeah, very true. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Thanks for your time. Yeah, Every you know, hey, thanks. And thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Peace.